Is anybody in here familiar with the USPA, the United States Psychotronic Association? Three people? Four people? Five, six, eight. Okay, so there's about maybe a dozen people in here. US, uh, United States Psychotronic Association has been around since the uh, uh, early 70s, I believe. And uh, it wasn't until, and every year they have conferences on all kinds of different uh, technologies, like uh, mind-related technologies, healing technologies, energy technologies. Uh, a long time ago, even you know Peter Lindemann and uh, uh, Eric Dollard, who wasn't able to be here this weekend, um, they're some of the past presenters of uh, the USPA, um, Bob Beck, you know, a lot of the big names that you've heard of for years who are really a lot of the pioneers of the whole alternative science field uh, from everything from, you know, agriculture to um, mind empowerment, energy, medicine, you name it, um, were at one time or another involved with the Psychotronic Association, the USPA. And then it wasn't until about 1978 was when they actually started to um, record their, their conferences. They were already having annual conferences where, you know, people came in from all over the place, just like this kind of conference. And, uh, you know, they had various speakers throughout the weekend, and that just kind of grew and grew. And, when, and, you know, some of the conferences, it seems like there's maybe like 30 presentations or something just on the weekend. And so in 1978, when they started recording those, it was a certain amount of years they recorded them just on uh, audio. And you know, this is back in the cassette tape days, um, and so the, you know those uh, have actually been preserved. Some of them are not in the best shape, but they are um, uh, audible. Uh, they're very valuable and they're very uh, historical. Um, from 1978 to you know a handful of years, it was all audio. Then eventually they started video recording these. Um, for a long time, uh, a lot of people didn't really know how to get a uh, thought that a lot of these presentations actually disappeared. And um, recently, actually, uh, Jeffrey Miller um, had made an introduction um, or had recommended that somebody at USPA talk to me to help get all these old uh, and new video presentations online in some type of digital downloadable format, kind of like what we do with ANP Electronic Media, so that more people can have access to this information. Um, literally, there's probably about a thousand presentations, uh, if, if not more. I mean, it's one of the most um, you know, incredible organizations that's ever been around with, uh, you know, material that would just blow your mind. Um, uh, today we have uh, uh, somebody that's going to share a couple minutes with the, uh, about the USPA, their upcoming event, and, and uh, some of the stuff that we're going to be doing. Um, A&P Electronic Media is going to be uh, producing all their videos as digital downloadable video, uh, audio and videos coming soon, and so all that's going to be made available to everybody. And so that's been a long time coming. I guess for quite a few years, uh, people didn't have access like that. And so I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Alan uh, Kaspersky, um, who works with the USPA, and he'd like to share a little bit of information with you. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, you made my job real easy. You covered about 90% of what I was going to say. So, that's it. so I'll just mention the name of the website is Psychotronics, with a P, Psychotronics, Dot org. When you Google it, you won't even find it, unfortunately. <laughs> but psychotronics.org. And uh, we have an upcoming event next weekend. So that's where I'll be after this. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and I think workshops on Monday. In Chicago. It's all on the website. And uh, he's right. I, I was in charge of uh, AV uh, production uh, since about 1990. And I've attended every conference since then. So if you have any questions about what kind of people, what, what kind of uh, you know, uh, speakers are there, what kind of t topics, I'll, I'll take your questions. Yes? So this uh, Psychotronics event is in Chicago. I'm not in a position to attend it this year. Do you think I could attend it next year? I, I think you can. can. Well, uh, it's been in Chicago the last few years, mainly because uh, some of the organizers live near there. But it, in the past, it's been in Sacramento, it's been in Golden, Colorado, it's been in Atlanta, it's been in Columbus, in, in Milwaukee, and Dayton. So. Next year, it's probably going to be in Chicago again, but you never know. Oh, we also had it one time in Laughlin, Nevada, in 138 degrees. That was fun. 
So, any other questions? Yes. What's the typical duration of the conference? You, it usually, registration starts like Friday morning, and the lectures go on till Sunday at five. And the, but there's, we usually try to have workshops Sunday night and Monday. Anyone else? No plans to go to other locations. Do you have any local representation or chefs here you could go to? I, I'm sorry. Would you have a oh, yes. Okay. We we used to have chapters all over the nation, and unfortunately, like our peak was back in the '80s. We had 300 members. We had chapters all over the place, and now there's really aren't any chapters left. But we they do encourage you if you want to start a chapter, please contact them. besides Chicago <laughs> they decide that at the board meeting each year so I won't know that until until Sunday so I, I don't but I would guess it'll be in Chicago again no uh, when it was a very popular back in the 80s I would say we, we would get an attendance of like 300 members 300 attendees between 150 and one and 300 per no no per annual meeting the annual meeting the chapters went from five people to I think the California group had 150 at one time anyone else okay thank you very much um. Well, this is the uh, uh, one of uh, two um, panel discussions, and this is what we usually do to kind of end the conference, just to kind of uh, you know summarize and re recap kind of what's going on or get any final questions answered. And um, and so, did y'all have a good time this weekend? Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, well, it's always an honor to be a part of this um, every single year. Um, it definitely takes a lot of work, and there's a lot of people um, uh, responsible for making it happen. Most of you, you know, I seem to be kind of the, the central figure on this, but, you know, um, Jeff Moe deserves a lot of recognition for you've probably talked to him through a lot of the registration process or a lot of other stuff, and if something's going on at A&P that seems a little bit kind of screwy, he's the one that's fixing it. <laughs> And uh, so, you know, I'd like to recognize Jeff for all his help. And, uh, uh, and we have, uh, we have Deo, Deo back there Deo. with uh, one of our longtime friends in uh, Spokane. And actually, um, Deo's brother owns the largest PC board manufacturing um, plant in the Dominican Republic and one of the largest machine shop factories anywhere and another company that I don't even know what they do, but if you're interested in that kind of stuff, you can talk to him. He's actually from Spokane. Um, you know, we have a Phil back here with the, uh, doing the camera. Uh, his company is KDK1 Media, Digital Media. And uh, I'd like to thank Cl Cliff Krause for hanging around and doing some photos for us this weekend. Um, and then, of course, there's uh, Rhonda Bedini, and there's um, Renee and Deanna and a lot of the, the Eagles Lodge um, staff who uh, puts up with us once a year. <laughs> and so, um, this whole weekend is really a, a significant fundraiser for them, to be, for them to be able to do a lot of their charitable work that they do um, in this community. And so I know that that's appreciated. Um, and so for some of our speakers, you know, I'd like to thank Al for coming down. Had a awesome time up there in Yak at the mysterious little lab in the mountains. Good honey, eh? And so, <laughs> good honey. <laughs> That's a bunch of honey uh, beehives. Beehives. And then uh, Yarrow with all his uh, contributions in uh, Energy Science Forum and being willing to, uh, you know, kind of take the initiative to, to really push the Zero Force Motor project ahead and be willing to share with, uh, with us what he did uh, uh, today. So right. thanks a lot, Yarrow. And what, what, one of my hopes is actually that the Zero Force motor, it really is uh, simple in concept. It's just a little bit different. And it's something that a lot of, you know, if you can make a Bedini SG, like a, a, a pretty decent quality build, you'd be able to build um, one of the Zero Force motors. And one of our hopes is that that would turn into um, another, you know, legendary um, kind of uh, 
uh, device that would turn in and, and become as popular as the uh, Bedini SG. Um, you know, there are a lot of practical applications for it. We're looking at, um, you know, scaling it up. Well, Yaro's he heading up that project, be able to pump water and show that it can actually do work. And so, obviously, you can see it's just in the beginning stages and it has a long way to go. Um, but um, kind of behind the scenes, we already know of some interesting th things that have not really been discussed about it. So, there's more than... Uh, me More so. than me, CI. Yeah. So, <laughs> and then uh, James, uh, you know, you've been taken quite a beating on the internet, <laughs> a little bit. And yeah. uh, you know, I kind of watched it from afar, and I've never really, um, you know, said anything. I just kind of stood back and kind of watched everything, and I, I knew how unfair it was for a lot of the stuff going on. I know a little bit of the background story behind some of the things that's um, talked about online, and it's not true. And uh, I appreciate you being able to come, actually, you know, bringing um, what you have, mm -hmm. you know, being honest about uh, what it is, letting people see it up close, and taking that journey. So thank you for doing that. Yeah. And then Jeffrey Miller, you've been around this for, you know, lo longer than most, yeah. you know, going back to the 80s, 70s. You know, I've been going to all these conferences, all the Tesla conferences way back that kind of pioneered a lot of, lot of this movement and a lot of the stuff you're doing at Energy Bat Labs. And so definitely I would encourage everybody to, to check out his website. Hopefully your photo gallery is working properly. Oh, yeah. Is it? It should be. Okay. So check it out because there's a lot of amazing work that, uh, that he's done. And you can see um, uh, the type of resources that went into that, both financially, uh, you know, with labor, time and effort, and being able to come out here and share, you know, some of the scoop about um, Newman and, you know, straightening out some of the truths about uh, kind of the, the uh, um, misconceptions that people are going to get from seeing the end of the, the documentary, which aren't true. And so, anyway, thanks for uh, coming and joining us this weekend. Well, thank you for putting it on. Thanks. Yeah. 100 this year. <laughs> yeah. And then... Uh, Jeff, you know, I've known, known him forever, and uh, uh, the gold magnet is definitely something that, you know, most people have never seen, and so anytime you come to a conference and you think, well, you know, I've seen it all, um, raise your hand if that's the first time you've ever seen a magnet pick up a non-ferrous material. A couple people have seen that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But most people have never heard about it, and most people think that, you can, that it's, a, uh, it's a fraud. And so, but in any case, it's, um, that has some potential uh, potentials behind it that weren't really discussed and so I think if you do experiment with it you are safe with it you know have it operating at a distance because those fields are not really um, healthy for you and if you um, you know do those kind of experiments you're going to find that that there's more potential in it than uh, was what, what was discussed at this weekend and if you are involved in some of those experiments uh, contact us and we can maybe um, share a little bit more with you um, but only if you're actually doing something with it. So anyway, thanks a lot, Jeff. Again. Um, so I don't know, does anybody have, do you have any suggested topics to bring up or questions, Gene? Or you, you always have good ideas on, on what direction we should go with this. Or um, if anybody has, or if anybody has any kind of random questions, um, just take some of the mics. That's what this is for. You know, after this weekend, you'll have, uh, this is your chance right now to pick any of their brains. So, uh, I do. Go ahead. Yeah, or, or, any, or any comments that any of you guys want to share, just, just go, go for it. Yeah. Uh, Frank, uh, yeah. Um, I know all about your work and everything. And one of the things I want to say about the two guys at the end and probably about two other people that I did not attend their conferences, and the reason being is because, like I said, I want to watch their thing with classical music and watch uh, the certain things. But I have done his thing, and I just lower your mic a little bit. Oh yeah, I wanted to ask whether or not you uh, replicated um, the force magnet, the force magnets that went up, and the gla and the light bulb that would be submerged into the water and everything. Uh, no, not yet. But that's coming in the future. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. This is a. I didn't get time to do that yet. There's so much going on. Yeah, no. That I is know. coming. That research is. The d that's what I'm here to do, to yeah. revive the uh, history of the EMA technology. Yeah, and that was it. Now. And the reason why I did not watch certain things is I actually wanted to look forward to some stuff when I get home to relax and <laughs> I pick certain but, people. But there is a ZTEX video that if there is enough time, I, we have a, a fairly 
decent copy of it. Yeah, closer. If there is enough time, then it, maybe it could be played, and then you can see what Gray did with the launching apparatus yeah, in his video. Yeah, exactly. What they did back then. Yep. yep. Um, can you explain what ZTEX is and what these videos are? Well, Ed Gray. Very briefly, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, it's basically a video of him demonstrating the motors that he had during the 80s, and uh, I think it's a promotional video of his fundraising, and um, he tells it in his way, in his words, and basically you'll see that the pictures will tell a lot, a lot, right, just from watching the video, and you can get a lot of information out of it, and anything technical, you guys be the judge. <coughs> And I, I've seen some of those videos before. Some of them have been online. They're really um, kind of poor quality. They are. And I know that when I went up to your place with uh, Paul Babcock, and when yeah. Paul saw those videos, he says, um, from his perspective, the, a the answer is sitting right there in those there, videos. Well, I've got one of the launchers, and I haven't dismantled it yet because it's the only surviving one we got. And I'll probably just to take an x-ray of it like I did with the pulse inductor to reveal inside it so we can leave it original because I think uh, in the future that these motors belong in a Tesla museum. So that's why I've been trying to get all the original equipment together. So if anybody knows where any parts are that are from this original research, bring it forward so that we can gather it all together one day. And when we fully, uh, when it's ready, then it should go to a museum. Really, that's what I think should happen. Okay. Any questions? Go ahead. Yeah. First of all, what particular event got you into this and got you excited about it and or what um, what you see as the coming free energy age we're going to be in? Big questions, but they could be small too. And that's that's directed at anyone who wants to say it, or all of you. I've always had a burning desire to achieve the impossible. Ooh. Yeah, baby. And the only way to find out the answers for me was to look in the universe to have nature be the teacher because it only reveals true reality. It's, vo it's void of mysticism. Taking that, taking that information uh, reveals knowledge to an open mind ready to receive it. And that drove me more and more and more because it's needed by humanity. So I've been driven by learning as much as I can, analyze it, figure it out. That's why I took a step back from the internet for quite a number of years there after I was involved from what happened in my life. So now I'm happy to just bring about what I found out and realize now and share it with everybody because I think it will benefit all of humanity. So that's been my driving factor is to help everybody and make the world a better place. That's it? Your turn. You covered everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Is this live? Yes, it is. Uh, the uh, what drove me to this is uh, really straightforward. I look at the universe and the world around us uh, as uh, a universe of play, the play of consciousness. And I look at the things that I did when I was growing up, and I was really focused on accomplishing this, that, that, and that. And by the time I hit retirement age, I turned around and I said, man, I have some really bad habits here. Just too damn focused. And I want to get back into the play aspect of looking at the universe from a playful standpoint. Because I suspect that at times, the universe around us is really a big joke. The playfulness there, the duality of negative and positive, all these things. When I start looking at the items that we're dealing with, which were covered from a dimensional standpoint of time and space, uh, you look at it and you say to yourself, this stuff is so cool that how do you discover more about it? Where do you look? And I just happen to look at the conference here. <laughs> it happened. Of course, there was a long-term interest in energy uh, matters and things of that nature. Some of my professional work was that way. So what really the motivation on my side of the equation was to get into the play of the universe, to do things interesting. And if by some chance of luck, I find something that is useful, then it's like perfect. That's it.
Uh, well, yeah, it's working. Okay. Um, I don't know if it was a, a particular event for, for us, for me. Um, it was kind of a, well, <clears throat> I feel like the newcomer here. We've, we've only been doing the free energy thing for about five years. I was uh, employed in the mainstream for 26 years, and I think it was a combination of uh, approaching retirement age and uh, um, just the shocking state of um, the system that supplies us energy. Um, and the, the, the um, just shocking amount of uh, corruption, you know, and uh, I was motivated by my electric bill in a large way. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's just, um, well, we're Christians, um, and I believe that the most important thing that a person can do while they're on this planet is to help their fellow man in any way that, that they can. And I try to use, um, there's another part to this. Um, when I was about seven years old, I realized, I, I knew right away that I was gonna be in uh, electrical, electronic, mechanical. You know, I, I just had this uh, insatiable curiosity and I was taking clocks out of garbage cans and repair, repairing them and uh, just you know whatever I could get on get my hands on it was uh, technical stuff we we had uh, uh, a couple of bootleg AM radio stations when I was 13 and oh so much fun mo modulating the transmitter with a guitar amplifier and uh, just you know I but I always knew s somewhere inside that there was something that I was going to do. I, I had no idea when it was going to happen, but I, it's like I always knew there was some, some uh, thing that was going to happen in my life where I was going to develop something that was unique. Um, I didn't know what it was until I started thinking about retiring, and um, the family was discussing um, what did we want to, what did we want to do next? You know, we wanted to do something to just improve the conditions on the planet and I decided to use my my skill set uh, to first of all develop a machine that we could get off the grid with to power our house um, and then there were discussions in the family and it, it uh, eventually blossomed into a, um, a plan for a global uh, organization to bring these generators to uh, people who can't afford them. You know, we, we were in Morocco. Uh, we go back and forth. Uh, we have a lab there in Morocco and a lab here in PA. Um, but we wanted to, um, well, the reason we went to Morocco was because of the business client climate is much, much easier there. And, you know, they don't, uh, the rules and regulations are much less. You know, it's easy to start a business. Nobody's trying to control your behavior there. Uh, so that was really the, the first reason why we went there. And uh, um, so now we have a lab there, a lab here. We, wanted, we want to eventually uh, supply generators to people in the mountains there uh, who have nothing, no, no electricity, no money, you know, to try to improve their lives and maybe have the thing uh, trickle down into southern Africa, because um, Morocco's in the north. Um, so it's really, at this point, it's kind of evolved into our assignment. And, you know, every, every negative thing that has happened, all the trolling, all the, uh, the paid opposition, it just makes us more determined. So that's it. <laughs> Ever since I was a little kid, I always liked being a little kid. You probably have sensed that. <laughs> and so everybody is a little child, and you guys all have it inside you. And one of the things, I was a school bus driver for uh, 10 years and everything. And one of the neat things was, was that I remember my first day of school bus driving. Um, I went ahead and did it and everything. So by the time, like, I think it was uh, November comes around, 
Um, I was pretty good at my job because what happened is I ended up getting a whole bunch of like, uh, uh, I don't know, food and this and that. And I took it all back to the other people. And all the people, I uh, gave it back to uh, the other bus drivers. And they're all like grumpy and everything. And the reason <laughs> being is because they don't have their little child in them. And so the little other kids sense that. And so when they sense that, they didn't like that. You know, so then they're like, oh, can you come on Jeff's bus? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so just to give you a, a, a story, side story, they had a school bus and everything, and we got all brand new buses with air brakes. So what they do with the air brakes and everything, the first thing I want to demonstrate to the kids to make sure that they sit in their seats is I demonstrated. I said, stand up, hold on. I locked up the air brakes. They all fell in, and they thought it was the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> so then after that, I said, now, I can do that once in a while, but don't tell your parents. And that was the way that they stayed in their seats and everything while they're running around. But we just had fun of it. But it's just like what everybody pretty much set up here. It's like be share people and everything. Now, the way I really got into the, um, the energy thing and everything like that is uh, little kids have tons of energy. And I know that. And ever since I, like my grandfather and everything, taught me the first few things about electricity and everything, that was it. I was hooked. I knew what I was going to be doing for the rest of life. And then basically, uh, at the end of the day, just got the Tesla stuff and replicated it. And I just want to get it out there in a practical way. If you don't have it in a practical way, and they're all steps, and everybody's at the same level. It was the same thing when I used to run track. You know, I was always in left-hand lane, and other people would say, like, how do I get in that lane, basically? And some people aren't going to ever get in that lane, but they're going to be in their other lane, and that's the lane that they're at as on their path. And don't try and compete with other people on their path. So that's just, I just want to have fun, because uh, it's just a big, giant, like, ball of fun. And the reason why everybody gets mad at everybody is because energy. Half your life is worrying about whether to pay for bills and this and that. And then the energy should be free. And what it is, I get back to the same old story. The bullies in the school, in the sandbox, have taken over. And so now everybody else has to sit there and stand up to the bullies. It's as simple as that. So that's about pretty much it. Well. I think we, a lot of us have a similar story. It started when we were kids. Yep. And when I was a kid, anything that was mechanical or electrical, I took it apart. And I wasn't very good at putting it back together in the beginning. <laughs> but my, my mom, she would make me, put, especially the electrical things, she was fairly uh, knowledgeable about electricity. And she would make me put it back together. And I would say, OK, it's back together plug it in. She says, I'm not going to plug it in. You plug it in. <laughs> of course, you know, a lot of times, you know, bang and the breaker would blow. So I, I learned the hard way, but I, I told you by my uncle Carl, who was a big influence on me, but I had seven other uncles and they were all equally amazing. They were all inventors, uh, mechanical, electrical developers, uh, you know, patent books are, are full of their inventions. And so that was a big, big influence on me also. And I was just curious about how everything in the world worked and uh, led me to follow through and go on to years and years and years of college. And luckily, I wasn't completely indoctrinated by the nonsense. I, I learned it because I had to. You have to pass the tests. But uh, I, I always questioned whether the things I was learning were really the truth. And then I, I didn't know what was the truth, but I wasn't sure that was. And then later I was lucky to uh, become associated with Aaron, and then that led to meeting Peter and John and Eric. And the, these are the people that really uh, had explanations to the way the world worked that made sense to me. And so that, that was very fortunate. So just one thing led to another, but it started with a childhood curiosity that just built on, on one thing on another, and here we are. I don't know if I have a comment on that because I didn't hear the question because I was fixing the microphones that I didn't think I would have to. <laughs> kind of got a feedback problem. The question was, why got you started? 
Um, I guess it's genetic or something. <laughs> um, when I was about three years old, um, my dad was stationed at Tarahan Air Force Base in uh, Madrid, Spain. And um, I remember uh, living in that apartment building. I can actually remember back when I was about uh, six months old. Um, and in this apartment building, when I was uh, barely three years old, um, I'd grab my dad's uh, monkey wrench, which is a crescent wrench, <laughs> and uh, I could completely rebuild my um, uh, little red tricycle. I'd pop off little red caps to keep you from getting cut on the bolts, twist off the, the nuts. I don't know how I had the, the strength to do it. I must have stood on the wrench or something. And when my mom saw me doing this, uh, she knew that she had to start keeping an eye on me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, before my dad went into the military, um, he was the first uh, Japanese factory trained Nissan mechanic to um, come from the States to the, uh, or from Japan to the States to work for a, a Datsun a dealership back in the late 60s. That was in Waco, Texas. And so my dad had a, a mechanical kind of background. Um, my mom used to work on her own cars when she was in high school because her dad was a, a master mechanic and and they actually my dad moved to Fort Worth, Texas and uh, um, started working at the dealership that my grandfather was at so there, you know there's a lot of uh, mechanical kind of uh, mechanically inclined people that um, have been in my family so it's just kind of in my blood you know I was always a car freak in high school always modifying my um, uh, car and doing different experiments and stuff and a lot of my friends in high school didn't really know what was going on uh, you know I'd cut the cut the hose off of a vacuum cleaner and I'd stick it on my air intake and then I'd <laughs> have, the, have it du ducting out of the front of my under my bumper you know but when you're a military brat growing up overseas and you're about 16 years old you know you're completely broke so yeah <laughs> you have to do everything pretty low budget and scrounge in the garbage to do those kind of things but I was kind of fascinated about you know the engines and um, ignitions and that kind of stuff but I didn't really know a lot about electronics um, you know, I was always kind of interested in technology, um, dropped out of college about 25 years ago. I started to go to school to be a software engineer and decided I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. Just kind of rebelled against the system for the next however, you know, uh, one too many years. And finally got my act together, sort of, uh, <laughs> later on. Um, and then fortunately through, um, it was about in the mid 90s. Um, I started just kind of uh, had some interesting experiences that happened to me. A lot of crazy synchronicities were going on, and one thing kind of led to another. And um, and I started to you know I was meditating up to sometimes 12 hours a day, literally for you know uh, weeks, months, and I just started writing a lot of things that were just kind of coming to me. And um, uh, you know I thought I invented the term free energy. You know I never heard of Tesla or you know anybody in this field didn't know anything like this even existed this was kind of in the early days of the internet right around 94 95 time frame and I started thinking about you know different ideas of uh, energy technologies uh, green building agriculture healing technologies and then consciousness those five things were all the things that I was um, completely obsessed about to the point that um, I was so driven by it that it would literally, uh, my adrenaline would pump. That, that's what my sense of urgency about all of this was, that something kind of needed to be uh, come together about it. Um, I already knew very clearly and declared back then that you know that's one of the reasons that I was born was to be involved with those uh, five things. So after um, you know about a, maybe a year or so, it got to be a little bit kind of too much. I didn't know anybody in this field. I didn't. I didn't even know it really existed. Started looking online, saw a bunch of junk that I didn't understand. I could tell was obvious, obviously fake. And um, but I came across this one website, and I kept going to it. And it was kind of interesting because it had. Uh, I guess it was just something that I kind of felt about it. Um, had these diagrams of these little motors and stuff and little schematics, and it was kind of a non-pretentious kind of website it just kind of had this stuff and it was a very poorly built website and I kept going to it over and over but I didn't know you know the difference between a transistor or a diode or you know pretty much any of that and um, but I just laid off and then a couple years later when I was working with uh, a mentor of mine who is a uh, uh, natural born uh, Qigong master uh, he was working with a medical doctor um, kind of kind of a well-known doctor he was kind of recognized as being like the first um, holistic OBGYN in the country uh, him and the Qigong master both were um, friends with Linus Pauling, Ewan Cameron, a lot of these 
pioneers a lot of the orthomolecular uh, medicine movements back then. And so, you know, I kind of got a lot of pretty good mentorship, which, you know, I'd recommend everybody needs to, um, first of all, you know, pay attention to nature and then surround yourself with uh, mentors. And, um, but in any case, we were at this time, this was about 1999, we were looking at manufacturing some uh, uh, red and infrared uh, pulsed uh, LED uh, type products for healing, for speeding up wounds, pain relief, and all this. And this was before, you know, most companies today were er ever involved in anything like that. And when um, one of the attorneys that the, the medical doctor knew, our doctor friend, um, he said, yeah, I know a guy out in the Coeur d'Alene area has got an electronics company. Maybe you should go see him. Maybe he can possibly manufacture these devices for you. And so uh, both Dr. McGee and, and Roger, um, they went out there and, and met with him. And when they got home, uh, I was talking to Roger, and he says, yeah, and I saw this, uh, met this guy, and he's got this little motor that kind of starts speeding up on its own and charges its own battery up. Instantly, I was like, you know, almost kind of flipped out. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And uh, I said, you mean somebody around here is into that kind of thing? And uh, so the next day, he took me out, and I went to this electronic shop, and they were building audio amps and, and all kinds of audio-related stuff, and went back into his office, and... Uh, here I am talking to this guy, and, and uh, his name is John Bedini. And so we're sitting there, and, and the first thing he shows me is this motor in a glass case. And I'm standing behind, the, behind his desk, and at one end of his desk, he had a computer monitor on, like one of these old cathode ray tube monitors. And um, he had this little motor in a glass case, and, he just kind of, and, and the battery was dead. The best thing about it, it was corroded old like D-cell batteries or something that were dead. And he just grabs the, the rotor, turns it, starts turning, starts speeding up. The battery starts charging, lights are blinking, it's producing all this mechanical work, and I'm looking over at this computer screen about you know seven, eight feet away, and with each rotation, the picture on the screen was moving like this, from that far away from the, from the pulses coming off of that motor. I was like, holy crap, what? <laughs> you know, how can I learn more about this? And he asked me, well, are you on the internet? And I was like, yeah. So he gave me his website, went home that day, pulled up the website, and it was the same website I kept going to over and over and over a couple years ago. And out of anywhere in the world, he's 45 minutes from my house. Wow. So, and then the rest is history. But <laughs> so I went from there to meeting Peter and, uh, uh, you know, a lot of these other, uh, other guys. But that's kind of, uh, you know, just being inspired and learning a lot from uh, John Bedini. And then uh, when Peter Lindemann came down to uh, Spokane, I might have been around 2004, he worked with John for about a year after he got some funding to develop the battery chargers. And so just constant, you know, John um, and Peter both being very gracious with their time. I, you know, go out to John's shop, you know, sometimes, you know, a couple days a week, you know, for months. You know, I was always welcome out there and just kind of watching and observing and kind of learning. And, um, and so that's what, you know, over a period of time I saw that they were really involved with these things that have been on my mind a couple years before, but I'm seeing that um, they actually exist and they're doing as claimed and that they don't violate all these laws of physics that I've heard about and everything and and you know not having a background in any of that um, but being around them my learning curve got cut pretty short and so um, uh, that's kind of what got me into it is, is when I really met them which you know not everybody is fortunate to have been in that position but really what it was was just all these synchronicities kind of lined up you know if I shared a lot of them uh, with you, mo you know, most people wouldn't believe how it is. Like when Susan is talking about synchronicity in particular as being part of a, a strategy, it's like, you know, are people not feeling, you know, too wooed out about that that are doing, you know, serious stuff, you know, and, and some of this marketing and social media and that kind of stuff, I is that something really taken serious? Because I'm a, I'm a synchronicity freak. <laughs> You know, I mean, literally, that's my favorite word. Um, if you search online, there's actually the Murakami model of synchronicity. You can <laughs> read about it. Um, but it's, it's the synchronicities that really kind of lined up. And when I kind of just kind of stepped back and just kind of surrendered, surrendered to the flow, um, it put me in the right place at the right time. And, you know, I never really went out and, and, and sought anybody. Uh, somebody came to me and told me and, and kind of in, introduced them to me. So I just kind of sat back to see what would kind of come my way on that, not expecting anything, and it happened to always be the right person at the right place. And, um, you know, they turned out to be, you know, some of the, the most um, authoritative people on their own particular subjects that I happened to be um, researching at that very time. 
So, you know, it's um, that kind of thing is kind of out of your control. So, you know, you can't really make it happen, but you can kind of, um, uh, you know, tweak your own mind so that you can kind of rub the magnet in the direction that you want. You know, if you want to really see kind of what my perspective <laughs> is on some of that stuff, I don't really promote this website, but AaronMurakami.com, I have a couple little papers on there on the synchronicity. It's called the Murakami Model of Synchronicity. And then there's a time travel meditation which aligns your, your past, present, and future self. And I used it to um, kind of predict what was coming one to two minutes in the future um, down the road with a pretty high degree of accuracy. Um, and then one other part was the devise model um, to kind of manifest these things into my, into my life. Because I didn't really have like a clear plan. I just kind of left it up to um, God basically to bring these things into my life. Um, but the, but the, my mindset in how I bring these things about to, you know, get me started in this and to continue on the, the, the most productive and optimum path, um, I just call it the, the uh, devise method, you know, uh, DEV is, or DES, um, DEV is for, um, or DE is for like a desire. And, uh, cause you obviously have to have a deep burning desire to do, um, you know, to do anything great. But when I desire something, I desire it to the point that literally, um, uh, you know, my adrenaline will start rushing. You know, sometimes I will fall to my knees in like almost an ecstasy of how much I, I desire uh, something to come into my life. And the VIS is visualization. And don't ask the universe to give you anything. You know, you have to know that it's already been given to you. Um, a lot of these self-help gurus out there talking about, you know, ask, believe, receive. And I think a lot of you know where that kind of thing comes from. Those are very destructive um, uh, teachings that are very bad. Uh, and I, I don't think that there's really a good place out there for them. Because as soon as you believe that something's going to uh, come to you, you're reinforcing the fact that you don't already have it. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're in the act of receiving something, you're reinforcing you don't have it. And so it's not knowing that you do have it. It's knowing that it's already been given to you. And then the last part is E which is emotionalized, that you gotta emotionalize it to the part where you're, where you're so cranked out of your mind in, in, in gratitude that you're so thankful it's already been given to you. And if you combine those three things, it's, um, you know, it opens like a magic window that um, things just line up and you will have an increase in the synchronicities in your life at a frequency that will blow your mind. And so I'm talking about astronomical synchronicities, you know, like you know, three or four days a week like the universe just bends over backwards to line up to provide whatever um, you're looking for at that particular time. And that's basically how I live my life, how I got into this, and how I continue on this path. So that's all I can say about that. Aaron. Um, I agree 100% because one of the things that I do um, is I sit here and when I do my day of work or whatever, I know what I need and there's certain things, and the way you do it is, if you think about this whole room or where all life, is like a computer. And when you go in your computer, it just sits there, and your cursor is you. And as long as you know what you want, then all you have to do, it's already there, you just have to actuate it. And so then you just sit there and you let the computer do the work. And so like there are days, I needed some magnetic wire, a certain type and everything, and all of a sudden, uh, a guy always brings me a case of beer at the end of the week to drop by and talk. And so he walks in and says, here, I got four things for you. I needed a certain battery. I needed a coil wire. And I needed, a, oh, what was it, one other thing. And he walks in. And he goes, oh, by the way, here it is. I go, oh, thanks, Carl. And that's how we operate. And the perfect example, and the guy sitting right here is he goes like this. He goes, Jeff, uh, I saw your website and everything like this. Uh, I can't do this, this is way past me and everything. Uh, here, you're gonna need this. And he walks in and he goes, here, here's a QEG. And he handed it right me. And so all my life is 100% exactly what Aaron was talking about. And the minute you understand how that works, you don't need to do anything. You don't need to worry about money, you don't need to worry about all that stuff because it all comes. It's already been given to you. All this stuff is actually been here. All we're doing is meeting it in time. So basically, we just wait for the sun to go round or whatever we do out there, <laughs> and we just sit there, but it will come here. But the biggest thing is the key part is this emotional part. You've got to have the passion because the passion is the electricity that runs the generator that makes it work. 
if you don't have that passion in there. And that's why when you see people all of a sudden like getting mad and everything and they get into a state of mind where they, they really are out of their minds and they shoot somebody and then all of a sudden they realize like about 10 minutes later the cop cars are there and they're sitting in the cop, in, in the cop car. They don't know what happened because they're so out of it. They literally are out of it, but their passion was not directed. And that's the key thing is to learn how to direct that. And it's just like you going with your cursor. If you don't know where anything is in, in your computer and everything, you're just basically screwed. You know, because you, some people go, let's search things. Some people like this and that. I never search on anything on computer because I know exactly how, where my parts are. And believe me, I've got millions of parts in my lap and know where, where they are. People go, are you going to atomi you know, itemize those parts? I said, no, it's all up here. I don't have to think. All I have to do is visually know where they are. And in the beginning, when I moved the one lap to the other, it t it's, I'm still learning the last part of my lab because I just haven't been back in the real super part of the lab that I stay away from and people keep telling, don't go back there and play yet. You got to finish up the last part of your work. And I know I came here for work, so that was about it. Can I add something there? Everybody, we, our minds are like a computer with millions of ideas ready to be released. Yeah. When we're all kids, we have that ability to visualize and dream of anything of the wonders of the world until we got to school. And <laughs> then we come out of school with a destroyed ego in a lot of cases, and the ability to dream has been diminished. So as adults, we're all confused trying to figure out the meaning of the real world and what it's all about. So these conferences and, and realizations of how the universe works, I think allows us to go back and recreate and reinvent the ability to dream again as adults and get excited again. And it opens up your inner creativity. It, it releases it. Now that you have tools of awareness of the creative process, move forward. Take that and do your research and invent. You have some tools and use it. It's there now. Uh, the other thing uh, that I would like to express to you guys is that the way I do things just up in my mind, I can, I'm, I'm like SolidWorks. I can think on like three different levels. I can rotate things. I can like, like I see in color so I can put like, like I can like look at that uh, machine over there and I can have it up there and I can put it, I can go inward, I can go outward. And one of the things that SolidWorks did when they started uh, bringing out their software program is that they started going to AutoCAD and trying to get people to like get away from AutoCAD. And the funny thing is, is there are other people that um, you, they're actually trained, their brains work only on 2D, sort of. And it was very hard for them to actually be able to use SolidWorks because SolidWorks is basically rotation. And then you have to go inward and outward. And it's a learned skill. For me, I got a copy of SolidWorks because I knew I needed it and everything. And in 10 minutes, I already knew how to run 90% of the whole program, you know, because I knew what I wanted in there. But my whole head just goes like that. And the one thing I don't get that everybody always tells me, oh, Jeff, do you get like dreams? Do you get ideas? Do they come down in your head and everything like that? No, I don't. I know what I want and then that's it. And I always hear these people, they write down at nighttime, they have dreams, they get up at night, they sketch it out and everything like that. I've absolutely never had it happen to me in my life. <clears throat> it's like I just know what, <laughs> to know it, it's weird. I'd like to um, share three fun little um, synchronicities with you. Two of them have to do with the conference, and one happened last night. So just an example of how this co keeps happening over and over and over, um, but not by accident. Like last night I was talking to Cliff, who's been taking photos, and we're sitting at the bar, and uh, um, we're talking about one thing, um, and then I just kind of tuned into the uh, uh, remote viewing, because I'm a trained remote viewer. Um, and... Uh, so I'm, we're actually talking about it for about 15 minutes or so, and then just out of the blue, somebody 
walks into the room, walks up to Cliff and I, and then he just looks at me and he starts um, uh, mentioning about remote viewing and asking if we knew, if we knew something about it. <laughs> <laughs> is Lance, is true or false, Cliff? <laughs> right, true, so, true, so true, that true. kind of thing happens uh, you know, multiple times a day. Um, as far as the conference is going, um, when um, RS did a presentation, uh, originally he wasn't scheduled for that. Originally I had asked him if he was interested in maybe doing something on the big uh, Dini Ferris wheel and he wasn't. And um, what I did was uh, I had scheduled somebody else who I won't tell you who it was because you might be uh, disappointed that he wasn't able to make it. Um, but we're obviously happy that RS was able to uh, share his presentation. And um, this one other person had us scheduled for 30 minutes and he was gonna show us how to build one particular thing that's made quite a buzz uh, on the internet and he was gonna reveal the, the whole formula and everything to it. And uh, he canceled and then the very next day I got an email from RS asking if he'd be able to do a 30 minute presentation on the poor man's three battery swapper. <laughs> Boom, plugged it right in so that, that worked out perfect. And then uh, several weeks ago I went down to uh, Nevada to uh, video Eric in his lab and we did a lot of video on that musical seismograph project. That was quite, quite an ordeal. When I edited it, it came out to be four hours and two minutes. And we were, that was going to be a completely separate presentation. And Eric was going to talk on a different topic. And, right, and Eric couldn't make it. And so he was scheduled for four hours. And we got a four hour, four hour and two minute presentation that we just plugged in. So that's kind of how the things work when you're kind of in the flow. And, um, and, and you're just, you know, um, kind of gear yourself to... Um, to accept that that's just how life is or can be for you. So I thought those were pretty cool. <laughs> Any questions or you had a comment, Yaro? Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, let's see, we have about. Oh, you have a question. We can probably go about five minutes and then, yeah, go ahead. All right. I probably won't be that long. Uh, so first, I'd like to just express my gratitude to you, Aaron, for putting on this conference and inspiring me to be here. Uh, I guess a lot of that inspiration actually owed to John Benini. I want to thank him for guiding me here. And uh, sad that I couldn't get to meet him in person. However, I also want to thank you for writing your book, The Quantum Key. It's been very inspiring and I followed a lot of uh, Nassim Haramein's work of the unified field theory, which your work seems very similar in mindset. Uh, never had somebody describe gravity to me in a way that I could understand or that made sense to me really. Um, I guess my question would be, well I guess I could lead that into, I've, I've been into electricity and taking stuff apart like Jeff since I was maybe five years old, taking it apart but not really putting it back together at least the way that it was built. <laughs> um, we'd have friends come over and put large boxes of parts together into something else. <laughs> um, but my question would be, uh, I've always been in search for a device that produces more energy than it consumes. And I've seen a number of different devices this weekend, and a lot of them I'm like, okay, well, that's complicated, or I don't understand it. Whereas the Newman motor was the one thing, it seems quite simple, and I've always felt that it's right under my nose. Like, I've been playing with stuff since I was like 14 years old. I got little motors and flywheel out of a tape deck and it's spinning really fast and I unhook it and plug it into itself. I'm like, it should stay going. <laughs> of course it doesn't. <laughs> and I was like, but why? It should work. And all these technologies that I've seen, the people have been messing with this for years and I know people have done this. And it's just been a matter of, I haven't seen it yet or somebody hasn't stuck their neck out and be like, this is how you do it. And I understand many reasons why that might be, but do you guys have any suggestions of a very simple or straightforward method? Like I've seen machines like the Newman motor seems to me like, well, that's pretty straightforward. And the guy obviously got a lot of buzz about it. And if you've got enough money to buy miles of wire, well, that probably would work. Um, is that, do you have any other suggestions on what might be a, a good avenue to, to, to follow or places I could look that I might? For for the actual for a device that produces excess energy that plug your house into in essence oh yeah i mean uh, the whole big thing about uh the free energy thing is it it's funny <clears throat> let's put it this way the, the, so would you want to make the newman motor or are you looking for a per, uh, per I want to build it. Absolutely. Oh yeah. So I want to build it, and then what I suggest really you to do is to go and just build like a little model like that. Get your hands dirty with that, 
and then just follow if you I still have those copies there so I didn't know if you bought one but just do it to T. there are the directions mm -hmm. and this is a, what I get back from this is the experiment of like what does everybody actually do that and then when I get when I find out way in the future that I'm going to probably be answering questions like well did you purchase that diagram and they'll say yeah well did the motor work uh, no I said did you follow the directions and it's the exact same way I got paid a lot of money and for me a lot of money is like ten dollars in pizza um, I got paid a lot of money to go ahead and everybody bought computers way in the early days. And one of the biggest things that nobody wanted to deal with was hooking up the drivers for the printers. Because for some reason, everybody thought that they needed to print something. They didn't need to print something before, but they, they got a computer and now they want to print something. You know, what, of uh, somebody, a picture of they, somebody they don't really like or something? I never understood it, but I got paid money that way. And so if you start simple, but the point was they didn't follow directions. And so follow directions that I give up. That's what Newman had. Newman had that made and in one of the books and everything that nobody actually sees. And this is the funny thing. It's been in there all the time. And it's in there. And if, you, if the people would have gotten a book. Now, I have to understand that most people that are new to this game never have probably even seen or heard of Newman. But when you see it and everything, it was all in there. And they didn't follow directions. And the reason why he gave me a license, he was selling license. The reason why he got me a license and everything is because I was the only one that actually made one. And so I'm sure John got frustrated because he just put the stuff there. But follow the directions first. Then you can tweak it. Then you can go ahead and do it. So if you make one that's a certain size, you'll run your house. Well, shouldn't I just go and build one like you drew? Because that wouldn't be following the directions if I didn't. Uh, build one more like what? Uh, just like in the plans, you got to make it this size. If you don't have enough wire, it's not going to produce excess power. Yeah, is that correct? Yeah, just fa just do it. Okay, um, just do it like Nike. Th there is a lot to scaling these things up. Um, uh, oh, uh, he just reminded me. They wanted to, a few of the people didn't know that I off I have those plans, and they're twenty dollars. And if anybody wants them after this, I give it to them. Thank you. Um, so the. Um, this machine right here is over Unity. RS didn't say it when everybody went to dinner. Remember when the light bulb blew out? So we put the light bulb back in. We filmed it for 10 minutes. I would suggest talking to him about maybe whoever wants to see a demo of what he was trying to show. You can do that while we're cleaning up. You know, I built one of Benini's SGs as well. And that's well but, but with the three battery swapper method like this and with Peter's modification and stuff, um, it takes everything uh, a little bit beyond. But that is over Unity. More work is being done than the net loss from uh, uh, the batteries. There's more work. This is an over Unity machine. Mm -hmm. Would it's, it be able to plug my house into it, though? Well, that has a pretty <laughs> big battery bank. So, every, I mean, it's just a matter of scaling it up. Uh, mm -hmm. One thing we saw with, you know, the bigger builds is that when people are making a little SG like this size, they're, you know, they're not really going to see a whole lot. It's just kind of a proof of concept. But when you start doing like a 10 coiler machine, for example, I remember in about 2000, Oh, four or five or something like that, whenever John built that 10 coiler, um, operating on regular lead acid batteries and stuff, it kind of, you know, it, it was pretty good. But when they hooked it to these big, like, AT&T cell phone tower batteries, where each one was like, I don't know, 1,200 amp hour, oh, two, two volt batteries running on this, on this bank, charging, uh, running from one bank, charging another bank, the impedance on those batteries are so low that there's no blockade to this radiant energy that can come in there. Um, to separate separate the uh, potential difference within that battery, and what they wound up getting out of it was I don't know, it was like a COP of like ten or something, like ten times more wound up in that battery compared to uh, what went it what went into the SG on a SG a ten coiler. That's no different than that circuit right there, but it's just using batteries that were so big uh, made all the difference in the world. But most people are never going to see that because the size matters. <laughs> yes, si size, size matters. matters. <laughs> You really um, need like forklift batteries. If you do it right, you get the big batteries, you need the storage. Now think about that from the analog of putting the Newman. Newman's got a big coil. That thing requires big batteries. They, all the, that, the, the little dinky things are sending the radiant energy into those batteries. And once it, you start charging those things regularly, it just happens more and more and more and more and more and more. 
So having the smaller models helps you understand how to make one, but it's not necessarily going to give you the over unity example. Yeah. The, uh, the question I, I'll toss at you is, uh, what are you talking about in terms of your loads and your demands? Because that in itself will provide you with some sort of direction and some sort of uh, approach that you can look at and lay out in a logical manner and say, okay, I only use power four hours out of the day, whatever the case may be. Or, and, and you work around that and you work at how much you need in that interval you may need one kW per hour uh, during that four hours. Who knows? But you have to analyze the situation, and then you can uh, take a uh, what I would call a multiple approach in that uh, solar panels are out there all the time. Yeah, I grew up off the grid. My father's yes. you know, charging so car batteries when I was five. Just you got a light bulb. You, you, you know, you understand a routine of minimizing uh, your uh, usage, how much you're sucking up in terms of. Uh, and over the past uh, 10, 15 years, there have been some amazing advances made. For example, just LED light bulbs becoming available and how they've knocked down substantially uh, power usage. In the state of Vermont, where I live, uh, the power company went out there and they funded the, uh, the cost over the past two years. You could buy any, any LED bulb for a buck. Fantastic. Uh, the same thing with water heaters. They went out there and uh, uh, worked a plan with the heat pump water heaters where they would subsidize uh, the, uh, uh, the installation and the cost of it. You got a tax credit. So there's a tremendous amount of uh, modern technical appliances who are geared, which are geared to low power consumption and yet perform a really good task. So there's a multiple approach here. And uh, my perception is for the future th that we have to also alter our lifestyles and take a look at what things are essential. And I'm not saying get rid of your television or what have you. But if you do upgrade, you look at the technology. Uh, instead of having a plasma, TV, which is uh, you know really uh, a large screen plasma that was uh, sucking up a lot of uh, KW. You go with a much uh, more efficient LED, and so on down the line. That's my suggestion for the future. As far as where the future is going to go, uh, good luck taking any bets because it's evolving so rapidly that uh, it's hard to predict any sort of direction. Uh, I don't. I don't think anyone can predict the direction. The digital age, when I mentioned uh, uh, to Aaron that the digital age has created also a digital haze. <laughs> uh, and that digital haze uh, surrounds people. Uh, it's almost impermeable at times when you try to deal with them. And I'm not dissing the younger people. I, I can understand what's going on. But that exchange of information uh, is, is great. But what, ha what has it done? It's accelerated. It's truly accelerated the exchange of information and how rapidly people want to have change happen around them. It's unfortunate that uh, uh, many people have grown up now to have instant gratification. Uh, it, I'm not dissing the lifestyle. I'm just saying that's the way it is. And uh, a reality check is going to happen very shortly where people have to step back and say, are we doing this correctly? And it's the next generation that's in their 20s and 30s that I see. I have a lot of contact with uh, young people in their late 20s and early 30s that are, are starting to take that look. And so there's hope. They're the next generation of leaders and it's those leaders that have to be addressed that we have to push the information that we're talking about here in that direction. I, di I digressed a little bit from the original question, but I'm just pointing out the changes are happening so rapidly that the integration of all, all these pieces of the puzzle is going to take a while to figure out. Thank you. And, I, and a quick hot, oh, sorry, yeah. Thank you. Yeah.
So I just have a yeah, quick comment on that, then we can take one more question, take a quick break. But on that, um, we've had um, six to seven um, legitimate over Unity technologies demonstrated at this conference. Uh, Jim Murray's, Graham Gunderson's, and um, one Peter demonstrated, uh, this one, and then two conferences before the um, Bedini's big Ferris wheel, that's absolutely over Unity. Um, when anything runs, runs, and runs, but you know, you, it, you wind up with uh, net gain in the battery, we actually have to slow it down to keep it from overcharging both the input and output batteries, then you know something's going on. But none of them are in, in, the, uh, in the shape to be able to run a whole home. A lot of it's learning devices, proof of concept, and that kind of stuff. So where we're at is that it's um, pretty much irrefutable that over Unity technologies exist. We've de demonstrated them and stuff. And so it's, you know, the next process is, you know, getting them up to the point to where, where they are providing those solutions. And like what Yaro was saying, Peter and I actually, one of our first books we put together used to be called Save on Home Energy, but now it's called Home Energy Savings Guide. And the purpose is, is because a lot of people want all this exotic, fancy stuff to go power their home and get off the grid and do all this kind of stuff with a you know, magic little box like that that just runs nonstop. But it's like energy gluttony for most people. If the average U.S. home wastes half the energy, then why, ha why put solar on your home when you're going to, you know, pour half of it down the drain? It doesn't make any sense. And so if the average home loses half its energy and you get it in a good shape where you, where you eliminate your losses, then your need is only going to be half as much. And so what the amount that people actually need is, is really only maybe probably between 30 and 50 percent of what, what they're actually using right now it's if they tighten, if they tighten much, that up. It's pretty astounding how much people waste in this country yeah. in power. To give you an uh, idea, I think I read uh, recently that the average person in the whole world in their lifestyle uses 400 watts. Now you think about what America is and see one of the problems with America is the fact that it's beyond wasteful. And it's got to be changed of habits. So when you think about the creation, the creator, it, imagine this. Instantaneously, I snap my fingers. You guys all have Teslas, and you all instantly, boom, the Teslas are going to go online. And then every single generating plant will crash out in a matter of 30 seconds. It's not going to be able to do. And the other thing is, is now that uh, all these machines are starting to become put together, and bigger and they're learning at a bigger scale. See, I build on big scale. So there is a completely different thing when you build a little scale and then go to a big scale. But now the third thing starting to happen is that you're starting to make your own generating plant for your house now. So unless you go read a book on how real power is made, and how the real generating stations work and everything and the power grid and everything like that. That was one of the reasons why I was looking forward to Eric doing the one talk that he was supposed to do, you know. But um, the funny thing about it is it, when you start thinking about power generating, then, okay, you take it big, and then all of a sudden now what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to do what I call the NASA move, and that's uh, drop it all the way down and squish it. It's almost like taking a big styrofoam equal amount of volume and push it down to like a lead cube and then be able to put it in their house. Now, everybody wants that, but that's going to take time. And what the creator is really doing is trying to recognize and say, look at yourself and see how much you waste. Perfect example is I sat here and I looked at all the food that was going on here. I guarantee that more than three quarters, because I've worked in restaurants, both sides, uh, everything in there. I saw three quarters of some of the meals just going into the trash. And what the problem with that is, is you have to ask yourself, you know, could somebody else have eaten that food? So look at that food the same way you look at your electricity. And then once you look at your electricity, then that, you, that, that whole giant thing right there, that'll run most of most people's things once you understand how that works. You know, that's the key thing. Thanks, Jeffrey. Yeah, um, I got a question about the ether, basically. Uh, I know that's what we're trying to tap into and get that free unity. Uh, if I remember right, I read so that there's several forms of it, if, if that was in a book, and uh, what form are we trying to tap into it? I thought I heard, if I read, remember right, there's like six or seven forms of it. Yeah. it, it correct uh, me if I'm incorrect. There's, but, uh, yeah, there's different schools of thought on the types of ether. I just focus on the basic concept. There's concepts as like the light ether, the dark ether. Yeah, there there's go, there go. different... Um, uh, interpretations of it. Um, I would recommend looking into some of the old um, 
Borderland publications, one in particular by uh, uh, Jerry Va uh, Vasilados. It's called the Vril Compendium. I think they're out of print, but I think you can find PDF copies online, and that goes into um, that, that whole topic uh, deeper than you might be sorry you asked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah V-R-I-L. Yeah, v -R -I -L. yeah okay. Vril Compendium. Computer that, and, yeah. So. And you said you find that on where did you say on? Uh, just search online. I think the PDFs are available somewhere. Okay. Because um, I don't think you can get them in print anymore. Okay. And Jerry is uh, what? G E R R Y. Yeah, yeah. And it's Va Vasilatos. V A S S I L A T O S. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot, everybody. Okay. So we'll take a quick uh, five minute break and then uh, we'll get started right away.